If you have a copy of God's Holy Word, would you please turn to the book of Exodus, where we continue in our study of the Ten Commandments. We'll be in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and in our teaching verses, verse 14. Exodus 20, 1 and 2, and then verse 14. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray, church. Father, I must admit that your word is quite direct but it is based upon your high and holy character. Father, bring all who name the name of Christ under submission to this. Let us see clearly where we stand before you today, and if there's any way offensive, O God, show it to us, that we might live as the people of God, pleasing and holy in your sight. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We should take great notice of this seventh commandment, the placement of it. It is a high crime in the kingdom of God placed just after murder. Think about that. Murder and then adultery. Today we'll look at adultery and that it is first and foremost a sin against God. And secondly, that adultery brings death. Death. Thirdly, that God provides for us in His Word. He provides through His Word. And he provides through marriage, given in his word. Fourthly, I want to talk about singleness just briefly. It'll be very short at the end, but I do wish to touch on what it means to be single today in the body of Christ. I decided today I'm going to close the sermon later with this passage from Jeremiah 31.3. But the message, I'll be honest with you, it's a bit heavy. It can feel condemning. And I I never wish the beloved to leave this place feeling condemned, but rather knowing where we're at with God. If there's business to do, then do it. But brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, I've already said it. God's love is constant for you. The Lord is always faithful. Here's Jeremiah 31.3. This is what he said to his people. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have continued my faithfulness to you. God is loving and faithful eternally to his people. But with that said, let's address the issue that adultery is indeed a sin against God. If you're to ask a hundred people who's adultery against, they'd say, well, he cheated on her. And, you know, in our world, that's largely true. But few, if any, of the hundred would say, hey, this is a sin against God. This is a sin set against God. Consider our preamble there, Exodus 20, 1 and 2. For I am the Lord your God. It is because he is God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We've talked about that house of slavery in the past. They were slaves to the Egyptians. And though they were set free now, made a freed people, it turns out that in their freedom they were still slaves to sin. But the will of God is clear on the matter, isn't it? It's a very clear command. None of us is to ever commit adultery because it is a sin then against God. God from within his holy nature and perfect and unified will has given to mankind order in the world. He establishes this. We see it in Genesis 2.24. This idea of God giving one man to one woman. It says, Genesis 2.24... There it is. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the structure that God has given to mankind, a union of one man and one woman in marriage. And to violate this is to rebel then against God's given family structure for humanity. Notice that the man is supposed to hold fast to his wife, not someone else's wife. That is said against God. That's why King David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. He was busted. He, was, he had been with uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
And this is what David said in Psalm 51, 4, Against you, Lord, against you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David knew that his sin was against God. And he also knew that his sin would have ramifications in the world, that it would have to just play out. It would shake his kingdom to the very core because the king had committed a high crime in the country and land that he was to rule sovereignly under the grace of God. He took another man's wife. And so there's a pattern there in adultery. Sin against God, and then it's a damaging crime in the humanity and the society that we live in. A.W. Pink, the theologian, said it to us in these clear terms. It's a command. It's simple, unqualified, irrevocable, negative. Thou shall not. No argument is issued. No reason is given because none is required. This sin, he says, is so destructive and damning that the mere mention of its name in itself is sufficient cause for this stern forbidding. The command in Exodus 20.14 is moral. It's perpetual. It's given by God. And the Holy Scriptures have much to say on the matter. Adultery does bring about death. It brings about a spiritual death. Death of marriages. And in the Hebrew culture, it could bring about physical death. Let's talk about the idea that adultery brings death. Now, the Bible mentions adultery directly. Or the behavior that leads to adultery. Some 91 different times. And in each case... It's always condemned. It's never approved of. And, and the behavior leading to it is seen as utter foolishness. And so we should take a look at all 91 scriptures today. You guys ready? Now we're going to do a sampling. We can't do that. We can't do all 91. We begin in the Old Testament. The Old Testament generally defines um, adultery this way. As a man having sexual intercourse with a married or betrothed woman. You're like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound right. But that's how the Old Testament defines it. And we'll get to the definition where Jesus busts the men too. We're going to hear that as well. The emphasis was a married woman having sex outside of her marriage. That's in that Hebrew culture. This is how it was given. This, someone else was invited to her marriage bed. Both our texts in Exodus 20.14 and later in Deuteronomy 5.18 Prohibit this. Leviticus 18.20 teaches the same. I know I'm going to jump real fast. We're going to go through a lot of these. And, um, but in Leviticus 20.10, we find that they're to be put to death. That sounds severe. Can you imagine our culture if they say, no, you're going to be put to death for committing adultery? Leviticus 20, the, the chapter there, begins with this idea of a multitude of sexual sins. Some of them are just straight up adulterous. Others include perversions. We won't list them right now. But they are all this to God. They are spiritually adulterous to God. They break faith with God. That's the problem. And they lead to the death of the, ind of the offending individuals. And so adultery is a high crime in God's kingdom because it violates the God-given order and his command of one man and one woman. Now that union and its perfectness was given prior to the fall two verses later. That's Genesis 2.24, the union given. Two verses later, Genesis 3.1, now the serpent was more crafty. Think about that. Right there, marriage given, marriage under attack. And Eve begins to flirt with this idea that, that Satan brings to her about being like God. And so she eats. She was tempted and she ate. And, and then Adam, rather than protecting his wife, smacking the serpent, he eats with her. And the sin was against God. It was spiritual infidelity. Think about this, what they had done. And it is the basis of all sin, future, and now in humanity, including adultery. Their short marriage was corrupted through sin, and with them, all of humanity has fallen. God gave marriages. It's the backbone of human society. Where the God-ordained marriage between one man and one woman is lacking, the whole of society, that society will be lacking in many ways, and there will be death that follows, even today. For instance, the U.S. Census Bureau, it compiles data, all kinds of data. It says, well, this ethnic group this, and that ethnic group that. They track things like uh, uh, marriage rates, divorce rates, abortion rates, and all other kind of rates. And the, the, There's a trend we can see by looking at that data on the U.S. Census Bureau. It goes something like this, that where marriage is generally less prevalent in a group, 
and, and, and we're not talking about individuals now, we're just groups of people, where it's less prevalent within that group, divorce rates are high, higher than others in that group. And abortion rates are higher. Death of marriages, death of unborn lives follows. There's death that comes with this. Promiscuity is accepted while traditional marriage receives little honor. Now, individually, men and women are culpable before God, accountable to God. But society pays the price, don't we? Society pays the price for the, the mothers and fathers in the broken homes and the, and the children that are growing up without dads that love the Lord. We're seeing the fruit of that bear out. So it's not a private issue then, is it? For abandoning God's provision for marriage and his moral command against adultery, there's a high price to pay in our culture. Israel is not unique when it comes to adultery. Many failed in that nation to keep this commandment. Adultery, it rarely begins, if ever, at the point of the sexual act outside of a marriage. That's not where it begins. It begins with a lack of faithfulness to God. That's where it begins. That's the point, the genesis of it. And I think it might be worth looking at the nation of Israel a bit, its relation to God. This nation would become to be described as one that whores, one that is adulterous. We see the law given here in Exodus 20:14. God speaking this to the assembled nation. You can imagine yourself standing there in the assembly as God speaks these words, terrifying them. The word of God, though, is consistent through and through. And we'll take notice of the progression throughout the Old Testament, and then we'll go to the New. Leviticus 18.20, very clearly, you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife. That's very clear. We, no need for interpreting that. And so make yourself unclean with her. Leviticus 20, already mentioned, adulterers are to be put to death... To purge the evil from among them. Deuteronomy 5.18. Now think about Deuteronomy. This is the, the word itself. Deuteronomy means the second telling of the law. Deuteronomos. Because they're about to go into the promised land. And what's in the promised land? Smoking hot foreign women that they're going to chase after, right? That's what's going to happen. So they're going to have eyes for foreign women. They're going to be dragged away. But he says, you shall not commit adultery. That's the... That's the, uh, uh, that's the description, right? Exactly what he had already said. Deuteronomy 22, 21-24, imposing the death sentence on people who would do this. That's all very heavy, isn't it? I know. I know. King David. King David. He didn't go out to war. And so, so what did he have? He had, he had time that's dangerous for everybody. Idle time alone. Looking at things you're not supposed to look at. That's danger for anybody. So David's, David's internet platform was really, here's what David's was, sitting on his rooftop looking down to see what he could see. And what did he see? He saw Bathsheba bathing. And David sinned in the moment. Now, now normally you would say, well, it's not sin if you just see something. But, but here's where he sinned. He, he gazed upon her, right? He then fixed his eyes upon her. And perhaps he may have even looked away eventually, but he looked back and then this was the birthplace of lust in him. He did not look away. In this sense, David is truly like any other man or woman in this world. All have the propensity of the lust of the eyes. Proverbs 5, we'll be in a little bit here. Proverbs chapter 5, if you'll turn there. It's similar to 7. Listen to the wisdom given from this writer of Proverbs. For the, this is 5 verse 3. For the lips of a forbidden woman married drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged Sword, her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Sheol, and she does not ponder the path of her life, her ways wander, and she does not know it. In this proverb that we, we read it all, and we'll look at different sections of it, we see wisdom, the wisdom of God's word, and folly that leads to death. I'm going to speak a little bit more on wisdom just a bit later. But folly is clear. We're to avoid those temptations. And when they come, look the other way. She's a forbidden woman. She's an adulterous woman. Look away. She appears sweet with honey, but she's really full of bitterness. Destruction, death. 
The same was true, rest wed from Proverbs 7, maybe even a little more detailed about who we should not join together with. That woman that, that a man should not join together with. It, we could flip this around. The scriptures are masculine in a sense. But the general truth is this. Don't go there. Don't, don't even look in the direction of her street. Don't look at her street. Don't come near her corner. You know where she's at. Don't go there. Other men will. They'll go down that pathway. Adultery leads to downfall and death. The prophets have much to say about it. And, and we, could, um, we could pick any number of the prophets. They're all going to touch this subject. Okay? Or most of them will. I will, I will go to Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. And then we'll be in 7. Jeremiah 6 and 7. Verse 15. Were they ashamed? One we're familiar with. Were they ashamed when they committed the abomination? No. They were not ashamed at all. And listen, the culture then is much like the culture now. They didn't even know how to blush. Like it, it didn't even enter their minds that they ought to blush. We're living in a time where people don't even know they ought to blush about things. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be overthrown, says the Lord. And that progression of God's word is, is set against Judah, Jerusalem, Judah. The people were individually guilty before God, but now collectively they'd come under the condemnation and would be sent into captivity. And the very next verse, Jeremiah 6.16, tells us why it's the case. They can't avoid it. Here's why. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. This is the old ways. What does that even mean? He said, they don't even know my law. Like, look to my law, because it's so clear. My very word. Look for the ancient paths where the good way is, and then walk in it. Walk the old paths, brothers and sisters. That's what we're called to. Find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Yeah. Many people today, they have no idea of this, but if you told them that, they'd say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to walk in that. But I'll tell you this, God forbid a professed Christian would not walk in God's word and do such a thing. The flesh is powerful, and so a man would say in his flesh, I, I want what I want, and I will take what I wish to take, and I will walk in the way I wish to walk. And that nation was judged by God. In Jeremiah 7, 9, and 10, we see their infidelity against God continue, and therefore He gives a strong warning to them. because his, his Word is always balanced with grace, but He says it here, Will you steal, murder, here it is, commit adultery, right there, and swear falsely. Well, he's, he's telling them the Ten Commandments again. And He says, While you make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before Me in this house which is called by My name and say, oh, we're delivered only to go on and do all the abominations that you've been doing. The covenant people of God were adulterous to God. This is how He sees them. It wasn't rare. It was rampant in the culture. This was their spiritual adultery, and it was mixed with actual, real, physical adultery. They chased foreign women who led them to foreign gods. Tough. Well, the Lord Jesus, he had some thoughts on the matter. God, help us today in the church, brothers and sisters. Please, oh Lord, help us. Let's turn to the New Testament. We'll be in Matthew chapter 5. That, that's a fast forward. There's so much we could say in the Old Testament. This is the reality of God's word. I pray it's acceptable to us. We begin where the Lord's teaching a higher standard regarding adultery. Wes, reading this, our New Testament scripture earlier. Verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her 
in his heart. That's a, that's a real tightening right there, isn't it? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away so your whole body doesn't end up in hell. Better for you to lose one part. And if your right hand causes you to sin, well, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. The Lord is strengthening, but what, he's not adding any real new thing to it. He's basically telling us the intention of the law here. What he's communicating to us is that adultery is beginning with your eyes. That's where it's beginning. And then it takes action in your hands, right? And, and, and so, or your feet or wherever it is that makes you move and take the actions. And so he uses this form of hyperbole, tearing the eye and cutting the hand off. Can you imagine if that were a literal thing? We'd all, well, obviously, most of us would have uh, one hand and one eye. The idea is simple enough. This is the idea. Cut off the offense at the source. Cut it off. Literally, look away from it. Get it out of your life. If it's in your house, get it out of your house. And that's the same wisdom given in Proverbs. There's really nothing new being said here. He's just strengthening for us so we understand. If your eye wonder, well, learn to look the other way. Practice that. Look away from, don't gaze upon that which is not yours. Do not allow yourself to be enticed. If your actions cause you to sin, seek the Lord. Pray to Him, oh God, train my eyes. Train my hands that I might honor you. That's a good prayer. And I think we would benefit, all of us, you know, if we, if we need to pray about that, it might be as simple as not being alone with your phone or your computer if you're having issues there. That might be the cutting it off. Don't be alone with that. It might be as simple as probably you ought not to go out with a, another person alone of the opposite sex. And you just say, eh, that's not a good idea. You know, <laughs> just a little office lunch. Careful. Now, just as David looked away, Christian men and women, we need to train ourselves to do these things. Because if we look, and we continue to look, the wheels of adultery begin. We're going down the pathway. Now, Paul tells us in Romans 12, or Romans 6, 12, and 13, the first part of 13, he says, Let, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. Don't, don't allow it to reign inside of you to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 6.13, the first part of it. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. You see the appetite there? There's an appetite happening, but the body is not to be given to that appetite for sexual immorality. Paul would go on to tell us in verse 13 that the body, what it is meant for. The second part, it's meant for the Lord. You are meant for the Lord, beloved. If you're of Christ, your body is meant for the Lord. And it takes us to an even higher cause found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Whom you have from God. And listen, you are not your own. This is the Word of God. You are not your own. It's, it, you're, you're not your own. You were bought with a price, a precious price. So glorify God in your body. Now think about this temple, tabernacle, the idea of a dwelling place. God dwelling with His people, tabernacling with His people in the Old Testament in the desert. But in the case of the church, our body is the tabernacle. It's the place where God the Holy Spirit is given to His people. Literally, in dwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason that we're given God the Holy Spirit. Christ, Christ gives us his, his, God's not done with you. You're saved. God's not done with us. It's not like he goes, okay, I saved you through my son, and now figure it out, people. No, God knows who we are as people, and the abiding presence of God with his people, and the abiding power of Christ resting upon his people is the only thing that will see us through this body of death and on into eternity when we will be glorified. And so we are conformed into the image of His Son in an ongoing and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now there are dozens of negative passages we could continue on. I, I just That's enough. I think we get the idea of reference regarding adultery. I think we have a clear picture, right, church, that what our bodies are for, that adultery is not part of God's plan. But I want to spend some time talking about what is God's plan for us since it's not adultery. 
And I'll tell you, he gives us really two primary things. One is his word. He's giving us his word. And the second thing is marriage. He's giving us marriage. Proverbs 5 again, if you'll turn there with me. We'll be in verse 1. This may sound like an oversimplification, but we'll see this is thematic throughout all of God's Word. This is the answer. God's Word given to us. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. Verse 7, Proverbs 5, 7. And now, O sons, listen to me. And do not depart from the words of my mouth. You're like, well, that's Solomon writing that. Listen, all scripture is breathed out by God. So whatever Solomon wrote down for us, this is the very word of God given to us. Listen to the word of God. It, it, it is his answer to us. We find it repeated throughout the Old and the New Testament. How about this? Do not depart from the, from the law of the Lord. Don't depart to the left or the right. Sound familiar to anybody? We've read through the Bible together. Obey the Lord. Live holy. Trust in the word of the Lord. Do not trust in the flesh, as Peter says in 1 Peter. The flesh fails like the grass and the flower that withers and falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. His word is a gift to us. So he's not just saying, hey, don't commit adultery. He's saying, I'm giving you my word so that you may not do this. God is providing for us. Bind God's word then to your heart to your hands, to your very lips. Let it reside in your mind. Let it be read in your houses and, and rejoice in it when it's sung and preached here and read here. Become familiar with it and obey it. But He doesn't just give to us through His Word. God, through His Word, gives us marriage. We've already heard it. Look, look a little further down. Proverbs 5, now verse 19. I think I've written down the wrong verse, but let me, let me quote to you this here. I may be in seven. Let me check real quick. Listen to this. 15, I'm sorry. 515. Listen, listen to the wisdom of this word. Drink water from your own cistern. Mm, I wonder what he means. <laughs> your wife. That's what he means. Your own cistern, okay? Because if you drink from someone else's, you're going to get a black eye and divorced and commit adultery. Okay? You get killed. Flowing water from your own well. Who's that? Your wife. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers. Don't invite anyone in. Don't do that. Let your fountain, your wife, be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. And in case uh, it's going to turn up a little bit of heat here, uh, a, a lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated with her love. This is God's word given to us. I, we ought to be saying amen. I'm clapping for that one, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, right? God has given to mankind the need for physical love. We have that. God gave it to us. It could be a, a, a physical love could be something like we need a hug, a touch, something like that. But then there's actual sexual gratification needed. It's something God has put into mankind. Sexual union, and this is the provision of God only given through marriage. A man must not deprive his wife, nor a wife deprive her husband sexually. Just want to be clear here. Think about that, that, that a husband is, is only authorized sexual gratification in his wife, and the wife is only authorized sexual gratification in her husband. Nowhere else, think about this now, we live in a really big world, nowhere else in the world is a man authorized to gratify himself except that in the wife of his youth. And vice versa, the wife and her husband. In the whole world, that's the only place. That's it. Nowhere. Imagine, if you will, the husband comes home from a long day at work. He's tired. He's hungry. 
He's thirsty, glad to see his wife. But recently, when he returns home, there's, there's nothing to drink. There's nothing to eat. There's no affection. Something's wrong. The husband is not wrong. Is he for being thirsty? Is anyone wrong for being thirsty when it's, they've been working hard? Is anyone wrong for being hungry when God has made us that way? Imagine the pattern carries out for some time in the home. And the husband, he's hungry. He just kind of looks out the front window and sees the pretty neighbor across the way. His, his, her husband's not home yet. She's setting the table, and he can kind of see what it is. It looks good, like whatever it is. To him, whatever it is, it just looks good. It's better than what's going on here at his table. And he desires something then that's not his. It's not his to desire, but he's looking. When husbands and wives deprive one another sexually, it's as though the spouse has nothing for you on the table. You've set nothing for her, and she's set nothing for you. And, and imagine that. If that's the case, you've set nothing for your spouse. And there's only one place in the world God grants us this gratification. How could we then deny one another? We may as well say, I, I know you're thirsty, but I will not give you a drink. Would any of us do that to the one we love? Of, of course not. This and the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 2-5, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man, that's a single man, should have his own wife. Okay, they get married. And each woman, single, should then be married and get her own husband. Now she's married. The husband should give to her wife, his wife, her conjugal, here it is, rights. Likewise, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Don't deprive one another except for a time or agreement that's limited for a time that you may devote yourselves maybe only to prayer so that Satan the tempter doesn't come in and drive a wedge between you two because of your lack of self-control. So when a husband or wife deprives their spouse, that, that's, where, that's open season then. It's like, hey, attack the marriage here. Careful. That's, that's dangerous ground. It can be driven by Satan. Let's just face it. When I'm thirsty, the, I'm thir we get thirsty, we drink. It's what we do. When we're hungry, we will eat. So a beautiful table of food and drink, if we're using this as a metaphor, set that for one another in your marriage because God has put this desire in us. It's part of humanity that God gave to us. Okay, and it's right there. Now, I don't want to get into specifics as modern tendencies do. Ten, ten ways to increase your love flame, flame on. You know, everybody. Date, incredible date nights and all that. You can figure that out. But I will say this. As a man takes spiritual headship of his home, as a man loves his wife, if, if he can do those two things, be the man the spiritual head of your home. Wash her with the Word of God. Actually read God's Word to her. If you don't, well, you know, if you do that and you love her, generally, not always, but generally speaking, these other things are going to fall into place, okay? All right, it's, it's a good thing. If a man neglects the spiritual, though, and he's not loving to his wife, I mean, I just don't see how things will go well. It's almost like a good luck situation. And I'm not much of a good lucky person or anything like that. Luck or lack of it. In other words, men, be the man that Christ commands you to be as a husband so that your wife can freely submit to a godly man. Women, if he's that man, then do so. Our culture knows no bounds when it comes to sexual immorality and perversions. And we must plainly state that sexuality between a husband and wife is to be just that. Between a husband and a wife. Anytime a person in a marriage goes outside the union or invites others into the union of the two, be it through pornography inviting in or uh, another person or persons inviting in, the adultery, it's already gone. It's already into it right there. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it says, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived, okay? Neither the sexually immoral, 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, there's our text in case we were wondering, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedies, nor swindlers, drunkards, revilers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now I've heard many excuses over years now of men and women both seeking to justify their adulterous behavior. This is why I commit adultery. Okay? Workplace flirting, online flirting, pornographic use, prostitution, uh, as, as serviced by, well, many who are, are married, and sadly some call themselves Christian. Beloved, don't, don't invite that, any of that, to your marriage. Don't invite anything outside into your marriage. It's the two are one, not two plus whatever those other things are. Learn to love what God loves. Learn to hate what God hates. And he's hating adultery. Okay. A man will say, well, my wife, she's just not, you know, doing what I need her to do, so to speak. I'll say this, yet even still, God's word does not move in a difficult marriage. We are to trust in the Lord. If, if, if a husband or a wife's in a difficult marriage this way, pray for them. That's what we're to do. We're not to rush to divorce. We're to lead them to Christ daily. Men, that's what we're to do, the duty of a husband. And I'm going to suggest that, that if a husband does that, and he's got a difficult marriage, here's what's going to happen. If he leads her to Christ, one of two things is going to happen. Eventually, she's going to submit to her husband out of love for Christ. Or she's going to hate her husband and probably leave him. Because she just can't stand it, being around this Christian man. It one will prove her faith in Christ is true, and the other would reveal that her faith in Christ was just in name only, perhaps false. That's why we're commanded in 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Careful, beloved. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or fellowship has light with darkness? And then we might wonder, well, what do I do if I've been a Christian and I did marry somebody that actually wasn't a believer and I knew it? Or in the case of where there were two unbelievers and suddenly... One of them went off and got saved and they're loving the Lord. And the other's like, what, what is this person I'm married to now? What do they do? What are they to do? The beloved never rush to divorce for any reason, really. Don't rush to divorce. Instead, pray for the salvation of the other person. Pray for them. Love them. Love them greatly. But love Christ more. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, if they separate, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved, but God has called you to peace. The Christian is not the free one to pursue that separation, though it may happen. I mean, people can get divorced for any reason now, and even if you don't want it, it can happen. Like, you can get run over by a an angry uh, spouse and a lawyer in a minute in our nation. Jesus teaches in Matthew 19, 19, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, this speaking, a, speaking in a masculine sense here, it, it, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Well, that could hurt. The idea behind the commandment is God hates divorce. And why does, why does he hate it? Because it's going to lead that other person, or both, into adultery, which is a sin against God. Matthew 5, 32, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus is providing for here divorce, in one sense, on the grounds of immorality, in, uh, which is adultery on the on the spouse's part. Paul allows for it only in the case of an unbelieving spouse wanting to leave. Think about that. Um, and, and you can divorce, but adultery doesn't necessarily mean you have to divorce. It may be better to reconcile for a number of reasons. I, now look, we, we can't know every scenario here today, so if, you're, you know, if you've gone through something horrible, I, I'm so sorry. Reconciliation may not always be possible, especially the way laws are in our land with divorce and things. It's very easy. Right? Because adultery is so linked to divorce, I, I feel I have to then speak a little bit more on the matter of divorce. And, and I'm only going to speak about it from a Christian viewpoint 
Because let's face it, the ungodly are going to do what they're going to do. We really can't be judging that. I mean, the, the world's full of divorce and adultery. That is what the world is. And fornication. In particular, when a Christian couple ends in divorce, let's say for unbiblical reasons, you know, like they just came to irreconcilable differences and all that kind of stuff, and then they remarry according to God's word. That's adultery. That's what, it, that's what his word says. And we cannot relax God's word in this manner. It's a high standard, but it's God's given standard. 1 Corinthians 6.11 and such were some of you, past tense, you see that, were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. And I don't wish to crush anyone, such were some of you, beloved, past tense, such were some of you in the past tense. Some of us were the swindlers, some of us the adulterers, the sexually immoral, the homosexuals, some of these come to God in past tense. This is who they were. And God's word does not permit us to continue on in our former ways because Christ died to save the sinner. Like us, his blood poured out for the redemption of our souls. Therefore, we may not as Christians engage in adulterous behavior. If you've sinned and divorced before you were saved, let me, let me just say it. And, and some of you, such were some of you. That's what his word said. But if you're washed now, it's done. It's done. We don't need to walk around head down shamed for the rest of our lives. It's done. It's over. Sometimes Christians, when they sin, now Christians getting a divorce for reasons that are not biblical, what are they to do? If they've divorced for unbiblical reasons and now they're remarried, what do they do? Well, what do we do with any sin? We must acknowledge it before God and call it what it is, what his word says it is, and then we repent of it and move on. But casual divorce and remarriage among Christians is a forbidden thing that will lead many to adultery. God gives us to the Christian as well for the sake of our soul so that we may not do those things. At the same time, we must consider that there are many who say, I'm a Christian, and they marry someone else who says I'm a Christian, but it turns out that maybe... Maybe one of them's not, and it's exampled. We, we can know them to be the false Christian, not because they committed adultery, or not because they did this abuse or that abuse. It's because in their adultery, when they're caught, how they respond to this. When they're exposed, the sorrow is for the consequences of their sin, and not for the wreckage that they've caused in the lives of the people, the real damage that they've abused people, or committed adultery against them, or ruined marriages and fatherhood and all these other things. And they're not sad against their sins against God. They're just sorrowful over the consequence. The Bible permits adultery two cases, or it permits divorce in two cases because of adultery, and the abandonment of the marriage by an unbelieving spouse. Now, there are many scenarios where we could think of a goal. Listen, I was in an abusive situation, or I'm in an abusive situation, and, and, and even though the person claims to be a Christian, there's problems, okay? There's a whole range of what that looks like. And this is where, this is where we can crush people who are suffering. Let me give you two basic scenarios here. One is a, a, a person who's committed adultery, they're caught, or, or they did some kind of abuse with their spouse, and it's all come out, and here it is, and they've come to a place of godly sorrow. They truly are repentant before the Lord. They're taking steps to reconciliation. They're not continuing the abuse and the adultery, okay? This, we're just, that's the scenario. It's my hope and prayer that the Christian brother or sister, who's ever on the other side of that, will also seek reconciliation. I, okay, in the case of adultery, they may continue with divorce, but if they can and they're able to, it's not always possible, but if they're able to, then, then there's a possibility for the reconciliation, okay? In other cases, an abusive person, though they claim to be Christian, their behavior proves otherwise. Uh, let me give you an example. A Christian couple uh, we knew in, in, in the San Diego area. 
uh, husband and wife, four children. Um, he was secretly into pornography, and what happened was she didn't know that, but he got caught in adultery, and that's when that whole kind of thing came out, adultery, pornography, and there was so they ended up going to uh, pastoral counseling. No, not with me. I wasn't trained at the time. And uh, through the church and all this, and things seemed to be going fairly well for a while. And then he left her for a man. Okay. And the progression was this. It was more pornography, homosexual pornography, homosexual acting out, homosexual then leaving his wife, his children, his faith. He left the faith behind and all of that. And that was, that was the thing. So what, what can we say? Some people get caught up in this type of stuff and they, they don't have a godly sorrow. Even though they said they were Christian. This guy said, I'm a Christian. But then he walked away from all of it. And uh, the Christians were judgmental and God's word was kind of flexible to him. They're, going, they're not going to listen to God's word and, and they eventually are going to have what they want to have. And what does it prove about their faith? It's, it's a false faith. That's what it proves. They're very much as an unbeliever. I say these things to us about divorce because when Christians, even those who are suffering, or have suffered abuse, and I'm going to be so careful here, rushing to divorce is something we should be careful about. It, it may be wise, though, and I, I wish to say this, especially to women who are almost the most vulnerable in the situation, women in particular, Separation is smart, safe separation in certain cases. It may give you time to work on something that may work out, it may not work out. I can't know all of that. I'm just saying that there are times where it's right to get a separation. In the case of a, of a husband who's committing ongoing adultery, or in the case of uh, uh, ongoing abuse, or vice versa and all that, separation may be needed. God tells us this, not to rush to divorce for the sake of you not falling into adultery as a Christian. And that's hard to say. It's hard for me to stand here and tell you that as a pastor. But that's why God is giving this to us. Somebody may do something wicked to you, and then all of a sudden it forces your hand to rush to because all your friends are advising you this thing rather than trying to work it out. And, and maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But the rush then is to divorce. And it can lead us into sin ourselves. It's not for the beloved. I, I can't get into any more detail here. I, I, I almost wanted to write a whole section about, okay, what happens when kids are involved and there's abuse there? And we could go a whole thing about that. So let's just say this. If there's any of that going on, and anyone needs to talk about those things, we're, we're here. Pastors are here for you. There are many types of abuse that demand immediate separation. That's the wisest, smartest thing to do. If any of you would ever need help with anything like that, our numbers are available, Pastor Gary and I, for the sake of the spouse or children. God's Word says you shall not commit adultery. Divorce and remarriage for the reasons other than God's Word authorizes is adultery. It just is. But God gives us wisdom through His Word, and it comes from His high character. And I'd like to now briefly address single people, and then we'll close. The sin of adultery, generally speaking, is a married person doing what they ought not to do. But single person can be into it because if the single person's committing adultery with the married person, it's adultery. But generally speaking, sin with single people is what we call fornication. That's what it is. But it's the same issue. Sexual gratification outside of marriage for single people is the same root problem. It is spiritual adultery to God. It is a lack of believing God's word and trusting in God's provision. Therefore, if a person is burdened for sexual desire, they should marry. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. And then 8 and 9. Because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. In verse 8. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single as I am. Okay, Paul. <laughs> but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And the answer of God for single people and sexual for gratification is fidelity to God. Fidelity to Him. And then marriage between one man and one woman. He gives no other provision for us. So get married. This is it. Get married. How about this? Get married. Stay married. Love God. Have great sex in your marriage. 
And we should be amening that. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Now, I, I'll, I'll say this. Humanity, most of humanity, should therefore be pursuing marriage. It's a strange thing when a culture forbids marriage for this reason or that. There are some people, few, who are called to singleness. I, I know very few of them, but they are. They're not to be badgered into changing their mind about singleness. That's not the issue, okay? We, we don't want to do that. But for those who desire to be married, enter into it wisely. And pray to the Lord about your spouse. And I'll tell you, one of the ministries of this church that we love in prayer is to pray for single people then to have given to them by God a godly spouse. Not, not just for gratification, but, but for the whole thing that God gives us in marriage. Let me close this way. God's word is clear on the matter of adultery. It's to be avoided at all costs. It's a sin against God. And spiritual adultery against God leads many men and women to actual adultery in their marriages. It is a crime that breaks down our societies. It harms our communities. It can lead to divorce. It can cause from that divorce further adultery to come into our lives. And in many cases it leads to a spiritual death for the unrepentant. But God has provided for us in Christ through his word. And he has provided for us even further through marriage of a one man and one woman. And I say this and all of it as we consider God's word on the matter that I wish to remind us again from Jeremiah 31.3. Let, let me give you 1 Corinthians 10.13 first. Let me say this. This is talking about unfaithfulness. Let me remind you about God. God is faithful. God is faithful, beloved. Even if, even if we messed up some here, we looked at something on the internet, God is faithful. Even for the beloved, God is always faithful to that end. Jeremiah 31, 3, again. All who are in Christ. No matter if the depths of your sins were great, even if you've sinned since you've come to know Christ, beloved, this word is for you. This word is meant by the high and living God. He says this, that I have loved you with an everlasting love. You understand, beloved, he's not rising and falling because of our temptation or failures. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. God is faithful. If you are in Christ, he loves you with that everlasting love. He is faithful. Let this word of God remain in your hearts, beloved. Amen.